Welcome to the Scientific Sense podcast, where we explore emerging ideas from science, policy, economics, and technology. My name is Gil Epen. We talk with world's leading academics and experts about their recent research or general areas of topical interest. Scientific Sense is an unstructured conversation with no agenda or preparation. We cover a wide variety of domains where new discoveries are made and new technologies are developed on a daily basis. We are most interested in how new ideas affect society and help educate the world how to pursue a rewarding and enjoyable life rooted in science, logic, and information. We seek knowledge without boundaries or constraints and provide unedited content of conversations with researchers and leaders who love what they do. A companion blog to this podcast can be found at scientificsense.com and this podcast is available on over a dozen platforms and directly at scientificsense.net. If you have suggestions for topics, guests, and other ideas, please send them to info at scientificsense.com and I can be reached at gil at epen.info. My guest today is Professor Philip Mauskov, who has joined appointment at Arizona State University in the School of Earth and Space Exploration at the Department of Physics. His background is in primarily experimental cosmology, in particular designing and building new types of instruments for measuring signals from the most distant objects in the universe. Welcome, Phil. Oh, thank you. Nice to be here. Yeah, thanks for doing this. I want to start with um, one of your papers from 2018, uh, millimeter wave polarimeters using kinetic inductance detectors for Toltec. I don't know if that's pronounced that way and beyond. Um, so before we get to the details of this, what exactly is Toltec? Is it called that way? Yes, sure. Yeah, Toltec is uh, it, it's a name. It's named after uh, a um, you know a, a group of uh, sort of the na- native group uh, in Mexico, and uh, it's named that because um, the 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 what it is is it's a camera yeah. uh, mi- at millimeter wavelengths that um, we have been building for a telescope in Mexico, uh, which is called the Large Millimeter Wave Telescope, or LMT, or in uh, in Mexico, it's the Gran Telescopio Milimetrico, or GTM. Yeah, and uh, it's um, it's it's the Mexico has actually a really uh, strong uh, background uh, historically in uh, in astronomy, like from the uh, you know early civilization. Yeah. Uh, and this telescope project, um, which was started um, over a decade ago, um, maybe actually more like twenty years ago. Uh, was uh, and and is still, I think, the the largest scientific project in Mexico was building the telescope, which is a 50 meter diameter uh, telescope on top of uh, Cerro, Cerro La Negra, which is a 15,000 foot mountain um, in the middle of Mexico. And so Toltec is a is a camera that we're building um, using the latest superconducting technology yeah. um, or to go onto that telescope and make measurements. And then um, location-wise, um, obviously we'll get into the paper, but location-wise, Mexico, because it's uh, near the tropics and arid and uh, it has uh, elevation. So w- w- what is the sort of the primary characteristics uh, of that location? Yeah, well, it's the primary characteristics are, are uh, elevation. <laughs> so yeah. um, for, for uh, um, astronomy, uh, and, and I know you've had other people on who, who also work as I do with telescopes in other places like Chile or Hawaii. Um, yeah. so, so basically what you want is you want to be, uh, uh, as, you know, as high as possible, um, to be above the, uh, the atmospheric water vapor. And, um, that's the main, uh, the main component of the atmosphere that, uh, that absorbs, um, millimeter wave light. So, um, so Mexico, it turns out, you know, has, uh, uh, fairly high mountains, um, including uh, Pico de Orizaba, or I think it's called Citlaltepetl, <laughs> um, which is right next to the Cerro La Negra mountain, which, and that one is the tallest mountain in Central America. It's uh, 19,000 feet or so almost. Uh, and uh, so, so the mountain that it's on is at 15,000 feet. So that's 
that's what you want. Also, it's it's in a good um, latitude. So it's uh, 19 degrees north latitude, which is the same, uh, pretty much the same latitude as Hawaii. And it gives you good access to uh, most of the sky. So, um, you know, if you're too far north, you can only see the northern stars. If you're too far south, you can only see the southern stars. So, yeah. um, so it's a good, good position too. And uh, the millimeter uh, size um, wavelength, well, so what does it target? What, what is sort of the primary target? Yeah, so um, there, there's, there's a couple, um, but millimeter wavelength, so it's long, a thousand times longer wavelength than uh, the, the light that you see with your eye, the optical, yeah. um, which is just short, just smaller than a micron uh, wavelength. And, um, and so what, what we're looking at is um, light from uh, uh, either from the early universe, background is the light left over from, from, uh, from the early universe, which uh, has uh, peaks at uh, wavelengths around one millimeter. So that's one of the things we can look at. Um, and then the other uh, main uh, sources of, of emission or light at millimeter wavelengths are um, gas and dust uh, in the universe, um, mainly in, in galaxies, um, in our own galaxy. So where, uh, where there's a lot of gas and dust is uh, also where you have a lot of stars forming. So we're looking at star formation in our galaxy. Uh, and then also um, in other galaxies, you can look at the, uh, the gas and dust with you know, farther away, so you don't get quite the same uh, uh, resolution and, and, you know, detail that you can see in our own galaxy. But, but still, you can measure uh, sort of overall things like uh, star formation rates. Uh, and you, then you can do that out to, you know, for, for galaxies at, at a whole range of distances and, and trace the evolution of uh, star formation in, in the universe. So, like so from early universe, meaning sort of uh, half a billion uh, or so years from the from the Big Bang. So what's the what what's the range we're looking at? So you mean like uh, for for the the dust and the gas uh, in no, the galaxies? You, you I mean, said, we're looking, uh, the yeah. large millimeter telescope could target light from the early yeah. universe. So yeah. oh right, yeah. So the the cosmic microwave background is, uh, is the the light from the early universe I was talking about, which is also. Um, what other telescopes, like ones in Chile, like the Atacama Cosmology Telescope or South Pole, so South Pole Telescope at the South Pole look at. Um, the cosmic microwave background is actually light that comes from, um, well, it, it comes to us from almost, you know, the very beginning of the universe. The last time uh, this light uh, actually scattered or interacted with other um, uh, matter before it hits our telescope was... Um, well, we, we, we chart time and we talk in terms of redshift, which is how much the universe has expanded since the light last interacted. So it's at a redshift of about 1,100, 1,100. Um, for example, some of the most distant galaxies that we observe um, are at a redshift of uh, sort of six, maybe eight, maybe 10 is sort of the most distant. So it's uh, 100 times, um, the universe has expanded 100 times more uh, in, since that light um, was was last sort of scattered, than uh, than any light from any uh, gravitationally collapsed object like a galaxy, um, but but actually the light so and and that corresponds to a time about four hundred thousand years after sort of what we call the Big Bang, which is you know as far back as you can go, so thirteen point seven billion years, and. But that light was around from the, you know, pretty much the very beginning because the cosmic microwave background light mostly comes from, it's left over from uh, the, um, the annihilation of all of the matter and antimatter. Um, when that happened in the early universe, all of, turned into photons and, and that's the light that we see. Um, yeah, so it has been kind of uh, moving around uh, for, for that long and around 400,000 years, uh, it became clear and they could get out. Um, right. And, so the, the detector uh, on the Toltec, uh, the kinetic inductance detec detector, uh, could you talk a bit about uh, the technology there? Sure, yeah. So um, this is actually something that I really enjoy and, and spend a lot of time uh, working on is the development of, uh, of, de of technology for astronomy and other things. And, and so this is, a, and often we're doing this using um, uh, superconductors because, um, this, this superconducting um, devices can give you the best uh, sensitivity um, and, and the lowest noise. So this is a superconducting detector 
that um, that works um, by a, it, it's very very simple uh, and uh, and in a way it's kind of something that um, I invented with a grad student uh, this uh, a type of superconducting uh, kinetic conductance detector called lumped element kinetic conductance detectors back in 2005 I think yeah. uh, it was based on an idea from Caltech uh, that was uh, published in, in Nature in a paper in uh, around 2002. Um, and the idea is that a, a superconducting film, so if you, if you deposit a thin film of, of superconducting metal and then cool it down uh, cold enough so it superconducts, um, the, 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 the way that it conducts charge, so the way, so the, way the conductor works is that there are, are free charges that can move around. Yeah. Um, in response to light, and that's why uh, it reflects because the the charges kind of mimic the light and then the light reflects the light back. Um, in a superconductor, there's two kinds of these uh, of charges. There's the regular kind, like you have in a regular conductor, which are actually in a superconductor called quasi particles, and then you have the superconducting uh, charges, and and those are made up of uh, pairs of electrons that pair up into these things called Cooper pairs. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and so when those are carrying um, current, um, they don't have any resistance. It's pretty incredible that superconductors um, work and, and you, you can have a current with, without having any, uh, any resistance, any voltage associated with it, and, and, or any uh, uh, loss in terms of uh, energy converting into heat. But um, the thing is that those uh, particles still have mass. Yeah. And that means that um, it still takes some energy to um, to speed to to increase their velocity. And so, if you want to generate a current in a superconductor, you have to um, you have to accelerate the the charges such that so up to a certain point, so that they have the right velocity, so that they're carrying the current. And and that means that there's some inertia. Um, so, in other words, it, it it takes a little bit of time. You can't just instantly accelerate them. That inertia is a form of it's a kinetic energy you're giving to them and that inertia is a form of um, inductance it acts just like uh, a an inertia an inductance so the concept of inductance is uh something that is pretty tricky uh in general for especially for uh, for for physics students that i teach to to understand um but basically um the idea of an inductance is that um it's it's an inertia to um, to having a current. So it's what it's what causes uh, sort of if you want to have a current in a wire, uh, it, it's what causes it to take a certain amount of time. You can't instantly get a current from yeah. from zero time. Uh, and there's two forms of it. One is the magnetic inductance. That's the normal form uh, where you're actually there's a because there's magnetic field associated with current and there's an energy stored. Um, you're kind of having to fill up that you know put energy into the field. Um, and so that takes time uh, in order to produce a current. And the way to put the energy in the field is applying a, a voltage or an electric field. Um, and so this is the, the normal inductance. But in the case of uh, superconductors, you also have this kinetic inductance. And the thing about it is the kinetic inductance can be really large um, in, a, in a superconducting film because it's related to the kinetic energy required to carry a current. And in a superconductor, since there's no resistance, you can carry a large current with a small number of charges. So that's, that was a long physics description to get to the, how the detector works, which is um, light that comes in, yeah. uh, interacts and breaks apart these uh, superconducting pairs of electrons. <laughs> um, and, and this is similar to the way that uh, a CCD camera, you know, your, your pixels and your camera and your phone works, um, except in that it, what's happening is light is coming in into the semiconductor and creating these electron hole pairs. And, and in, the, in a silicon uh, uh, detector like that, it takes a certain amount of energy. There's a, there's a binding energy that you need to, to break those, um, those pairs, and that's about uh, equivalent to the energy in a single optical photon. Yeah. But we're detecting millimeter wave photons, which are a thousand times lower energy. Fortunately, superconducting uh, pairs of charges um, have a binding energy that's approximately a thousand times smaller <laughs> than the binding energy in a semiconductor. So, yeah. so, so millimeter wave photons come in and break apart these uh, Cooper pairs in superconductor. And, that, and the problem is it doesn't change the resistance because the resistance is still zero. 
Um, but what it does change is the inductance because it changes the inductance related to the number of these Cooper pairs or these pairs of electrons that are carrying the current. And so if you can measure the inductance in your superconducting film, then all you need to do is hold your film up to light and have light shine on it and then measure the inductance and then you're measuring how much light is coming in. Oh, wow. And so it's hard. So the last piece is measuring inductance. The way we do it is by patterning the film in the form of an electromagnetic resonator. So we put a capacitance in parallel and then that resonates. It cancels out the inductance. And then what we look at is the, the change in the resonant frequency. So think of it as kind of like we have these electromagnetic tuning forks that are ringing for a really long time because they're perfect superconducting resonators. Um, and we can hear the tone that it's ringing. Yeah. And then if we shine light on each one, the tone changes a little bit. And so by listening to the tone of the resonator, we can tell how much light is hitting the resonator. And then we can make, we can pattern on a, on a single wafer, we can pattern thousands of these uh, in resonators and design them so that each one has a different tone. Uh, and then we can listen to all the tones simultaneously, and then we can unwrap which tone we're listening to and track it and measure the light. And we can do that really, really well with it, with like very, very small number of external components. And so this is a really kind of revolutionary style technology because detecting these long wavelength um, photons with low energy, it has been, um, you know, it is more difficult than it is uh, to detect the optical type photons. Yeah, it, it almost sounds like this is a necessary um, necessary requirement, right? So let, let me see if I if I understand it, uh, Phil. So inductance is very much like inertia. Uh, yep. What we have in superconductor is sort of kinetic inductance. And you have this uh, Cooper pairs of electrons, a light, a photon comes in, breaks them apart, and they start to move. And that, that movement um, results in somewhat of a, a, a differential change in inductance. Do, do I understand yeah. it? Yeah, exactly. So, um, I mean, literally, kinetic inductance is actually the same as inertia. Um, and it's so... Uh, yeah, so it's exactly that. Um, essentially, what you're doing is changing, if you like, the, the total mass of the charges that can carry the current. And um, you're doing that by breaking apart Cooper pairs. When you break apart the Cooper pairs, the, those electrons, those charges, are now no longer participating in the carrying of current because they have resistance. And it's just the remaining ones that are still paired that have no resistance, and those are the ones that are carrying uh, the the current and so you're by breaking these apart you're reducing um, the 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 mass it turns out so the it's like you're increasing the kinetic inductance because um, reducing the mass means you have to have the charges the remaining charges have to be travel faster to carry the same current so um, to do that means that you know the inductance is actually more. So, so before this idea, um, did we not have a way to detect this very low energy uh, millimeter uh, no. wavelength? No, no, we, we did. We had other ways. And, and actually going way back, uh, I worked with instruments, um, you know, all the way back uh, from when I was in graduate school, um, where we used uh, detectors, type of detector called a bolometer. And these are still used. Um, uh, these detectors, when I was in graduate school, which was in the 1990s, um, these were, we, we were, I was literally making um, bolometers uh, by hand with glue and like sticks of wood. <laughs> um, and so we, we, we transitioned from making, um, you know, individual detectors um, to uh, a, making uh, arrays, small arrays of these types of detectors. Uh, in in a fabrication uh, setting like like this similar to what you know you use for making uh, CCDs, um, and so that was that was a big step forward. The problem with the uh, bolometers is that uh, at least compared to uh, kinetic inductance detectors, there's there's two complications. The first one is that um, bolometers are are difficult to make because the way they work is that they're they're thermally isolated islands absorbers which has a thermometer on it. So you absorb light and then heats up and then, uh, you know, you measure that with a thermometer. 
Um, and so in order to make it, you have to make these arrays of these kind of delicate, you know, uh, thermally isolated structures, which use, usually are now made out of things like thin films of membranes of silicon nitride, for example. Um, and then you have to have these thermometers and then reading out the thermometers, since the thermometers are not like giving off these tones, for example, um, they just are a resistor. So you have to have a way of reading out thousands of resistors. Um, and so in order to do that, you use a whole nother th technique, which is a superconducting uh, a type uh, current sensor called a superconducting quantum interference device or squid. And, and that requires, you know, a whole nother fabrication. It's cold and it, it requires, you know, 16 layers of fabrication or something in the, the bolometers. The kinetic inductance detector array is, a, is actually a single deposition, single patterning step. <laughs> At least that's how it happened for us. Uh, th those were the early ones. Now they're slightly more complicated, but still a lot simpler to fabricate one and a lot simpler to read out in large numbers with, uh, with a, a simple frequency division multiplexing. So, so there's some advantages. Um, yeah. And it really makes it now because so now that we've been um, building cameras with more and more pixels, and this is true in the optical in your phone, but it's also true for astronomy at longer wavelengths, um, sort of it's really important to be able to scale up. Uh, and this is one of the ways that I think really helps us uh, scale up. To so learn. easy to manufacture, I would imagine lower cost overall. So would you say it, these, th these, this technology will essentially be uh, is sort of the go-to technology going forward? I think it it's clearly has uh, been taking over uh, in certain areas. So um, at shorter wavelengths, so um, in, the, in what we would call the submillimeter or far infrared, uh, yeah. pretty much most uh, instruments now that are being proposed uh, or um, are being uh, um, built are using uh, kinetic inductance detectors, uh, especially instruments like um, uh, the one that so one I was involved in called uh, uh, BLAST, which was a balloon-borne uh, um, instrument that uh, flew yeah. from Antarctica uh, that used kinetic inductance detectors. Um, and uh, future NASA missions like the Origin Space Telescope. Um, and the uh, galaxy emission probe are both being studied, and uh, those will be um, planned to, to use uh, kinetic inductance detectors um, at uh, shorter wavelengths. At millimeter wavelengths um, from the ground, um, there are still a number of experiments that are using uh, these uh, bolometers, using uh, um, superconducting thermometers, um, and there are also uh, instruments that are using kinetic inductance detectors. So I'd say it's it's approximately 50-50 <laughs> at the moment. Um, yeah. And uh, and and it guess it just depends on exactly what what you want to do. There's some things that I think people have developed that you can do with uh, with the bolometers that are still not fully developed with the kinetic inductance detectors because they they are a, a technology that has been uh, sort of proposed or is, is developed a, a little bit later on. So it may be that as, as things move forward, more start switching over. Um, but it's also, you know, it, it's also true that uh, the bolometers are, are still having uh, uh, progress in their, in their development. And, and so we'll see. But I think certainly at the shorter wavelengths, mostly now people are looking at uh, kinetic inductance detectors as the, the main option. Yeah, so this has been your passion, Phil. So you, you have designed these things for many instruments. Uh, we talked about Toltec already. You mentioned BLAST. Uh, I found that uh, very interesting. Uh, could you talk a bit about, so this is an experiment, a balloon-based experiment in the Antarctic? Yeah, right. So BLAST stands for, I try to get it right, uh, Balloon Born Large Aperture Submillimeter Telescope. It's a uh, uh, it's, an, it's a project that's been going on um, for about 20 years um, now, and, and uh, there have been, I think, a total of six uh, balloon flights. So NASA, this is a NASA-funded um, uh, project. Um, NASA has a, a whole program of uh, what's called suborbital um, missions and uh, technology development, and so that includes uh, balloons. So they have these giant helium balloons. They're the size of a football field um, when they're fully inflated and they fly and carry up to about 
five or 6,000 pounds up to, um, way out of the atmosphere, up to three millibars pressure. So above 99.7% of the, uh, atmosphere. And that's about a 35 kilometers above the ground. So it's much higher than any, uh, mountain. Um, and, uh, and so blast has flown, um, on one of these balloons blast is, a. It's been up to a 2.5 meter um, primary mirror. So this is a big telescope, similar in size to the Hubble. Um, and uh, and it, it has a, a camera with, uh, again, three um, colors. Uh, and each one of the, um, uh, of the, the, the colors has um, not only, it has basically polarization sensitivity, so it can see uh, it can distinguish the polarization of the light. Um, and we had, uh, we had our last flight, uh, a little over a year ago, um, January, just before the pandemic, um, from Antarctica, it was with these three arrays of kinetic inductance detectors. Um, and it was after uh, a long campaign and, um, yeah, I have, uh, I have this blog that I, I took cause it yeah, I read, I read the blog. <laughs> um, yeah, it can be imagine uh the you know the, the number of times you tried and and uh and it, so many things have to come right uh, for it to work right yes it's a challenge the just just the launching of this giant uh balloon uh is very challenging because any the wind conditions have to be just huge wind sail it's literally the size of, of a football field it's like you know incredibly long uh, it's, it's somewhat fragile and it's, uh, it, it, yeah, it's pulling, it's trying to pull up a 6,000 pound thing. Um, it's, so the launch is, is very challenging. Um, you know, the instrument, uh, to, you know, it, it requires cryogenics, so it's got liquid helium. So you have to do helium fills before launch. And it's, it's a lot of work. Uh, it's mostly done by, um, graduate students so this is uh for nasa this is uh it's a high risk um activity and uh, one of the main purposes is is training the next generation of uh, scientists and engineers and also testing new technology so one of the things that that was successful cheap go ahead it's also cheap labor and it's cheap it's cheap labor yes uh to be a graduate student you know uh you have to you have to be able to um, solder and uh, and live off of uh, you know a, a fairly low stipend, um, but uh, it's um, it, it's it's also really useful for testing new technologies for NASA for space flight. So this was one of the the main uh, sort of tests for um, kinetic inductance detectors as a technology to be used on future space missions, and in that it was very successful because. Uh, we launched, um, we got to float, um, we, uh, we made some observations, we measured the detector response and the response of the readout electronics and everything was working well. And so that counts as, yes, NASA says, check, uh, this technology has been tested and is now suitable to be proposed to fly on a space mission. Unfortunately, uh, on launch, we had an incident where there's a collar that holds the balloon when they launch it that that is um, released after launch. And um, usually that's fine, but uh, I guess one out of every, between 20 and 100 launches, um, the collar when it falls uh, hits the payload. <laughs> and that's what happened to us. It, it, it hit the payload. Um, and then about 10 hours after we arrived, we got to our, our altitude up to 35 kilometers, um, a piece that had been damaged, presumably um, in that, uh, in launch, uh, a piece, a structural piece broke, uh, and we were no longer able to point the telescope. So um, we only got about 10 or 12 hours of data instead of three weeks, which is what wow. we were hoping for. So, so I would imagine, Phil, uh, this is a very large balloon. It, it's a helium, yes. right? Helium balloon that goes all the way up to what what, alt, what uh, height? Uh, yeah, so about 35 um, kilometers height. So, uh, you know, an airplane is, uh, flying at like, uh, seven or eight kilometers. Um, the, the, yeah, it's about 125,000 feet. Um, I guess so about 10 times, you know, a, a, a typical sort of tall mountain, right. Um, higher. And, 
it's not quite in space, but um, at that at that height, the sky, even when the sun is up, is uh, is completely black. There's there's very little uh, atmosphere. Uh, as I said, there's it's about three millibars. It's it's uh, slim, similar to or or maybe slightly more than uh, slightly less than the atmospheric pressure on the surface of Mars. <laughs> Um, so it's, uh, it's enough in space that you can basically do a lot of astronomy that, you know, you would normally need to be in orbit to do, um, but you can do, um, more cheaply from the balloon. Uh, and, uh, but as I said, it's, it's also, uh, uh riskier, I think, than, uh, you know, than, than normal, uh, launches of, of satellite, uh, telescopes. So, so that the mission that you flew, you got some data. You see here, um, in the, uh, polarized thermal emission from interstellar dust revealing magnetic field structures in nearby giant molecular clouds. So, did we actually get some real data from the mission that that flew up there? We we did. We we scanned across. Uh, we did some scans on the sky when we were still able to to point, and uh, we we detected in. While we could see it while we were there, and and then since we've been working on uh, doing sort of more detailed, uh, uh, you know, map reconstruction of the of the data um, uh, after the flight. Um, so we have some sources that we've measured. Um, we've also got data from a previous flight where we we measured some sources uh, and magnetic fields, uh, or or polarized dust emission, and then um, inferred uh, information about magnetic fields in star forming regions. We obviously didn't get as much data as as we wanted to, and we weren't really able to uh, to get any data on our our main science targets. So, so, but since we proved the technology works, um, we are currently uh, you know proposing still, and we had a proposal that was in to NASA that was uh, uh, I, it was it was very well rated, but there were a limited number of uh, of of, uh, of missions uh, selected for the last round. So we weren't selected last time. We were encouraged to reapply uh, to, to fly a, uh, another version, um, rebuilding and, and doing this again to do a, a more comprehensive survey. And I think, you know, part of this is uh, this was the first test of the new detector technology and uh, a lot of other things. So we're a lot more confident that now, um, you know, if we get the go ahead, that we'll be able to fairly quickly uh, build, you know, uh, rebuild uh, an instrument that is uh, even more capable and uh, and actually get uh, all of the science that we we were hoping to get with this flight. And how much time would you typically have in in a in a flight? And how do how do you bring it down? You essentially releasing the helium to bring it down. Yeah, that's what they do. So um, so in Antarctica, the balloons um, are launched in the Antarctic summer. Um, the sun is up, which yeah. provides your energy through solar panels on the, on the back, and you point. We point our telescope away from the sun, um, where, as I said, the sky, you know, at that al altitude is is black enough. It's it's pretty much uh, perfectly black. There's very little scattering, um, and in Antarctica in the summer, the the winds take you around at at uh, 120,000 feet. The winds take you around in a circle, um, and so you after between 10 and 14 days. Uh, you, uh, your balloon that you've launched uh, comes back around to, you know, relatively close to where you launched it from. Uh, and usually one time around um, is when uh, most uh, experiments and most groups uh, will, uh, will ask NASA, who have control over the balloon, and they have uh, uh, commands that they can send to rip open the balloon and release the helium and then uh, drop the payload. So usually they'll do that when it comes around the first time. We were kind of thinking, ideally, we'd like to go around two times. <laughs> um, so we get more data, right? So uh, more like 20 days uh, of data. Um, but uh, th this is what's called a long duration balloon flight is uh, between sort of 10 and uh, 10, 20 or 30 days. Um, there are also ultra long duration balloon flights that NASA uh, has been developing and has launched a few um, and these are launched not from Antarctica, but um, from other places like uh, New Zealand, and those can stay up for up to 100 days. Um, and that's what we're targeting for our next uh, proposal is a, a slightly longer flight with a, a goal of like more like 30 days. Um, so that, that's the plan. Yeah. 
I remember, uh, Phil, a uh, long time ago, I don't know what the status of this is. This was also in New Zealand. I think it was Google was, was trying balloon-based internet. Yeah. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what happened. Yeah, no, that no, absolutely. I mean, and even there was a, uh, there was a lab, there was a, an office here in Arizona because a student of mine, um, you know, I think went to work there or had an interview there. Uh, for for a, a Google Alpha, it was an Alpha project about balloon bore millimeter wave internet. So they were going to uh, have uh, balloons, you know, flying and uh, and then have them uh, transmit and receive millimeter waves uh, and use that as a uh, as an internet method. And I think they gave up on it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so we'll take a quick break, uh, sure. Phil. When we come back, um, we'll talk about uh, the Steer X uh, mission as well as uh, your most recent paper on the superconducting kinetic inductance qubits for quantum computing. All right, sounds good. Thank you. This is a Scientific Sense podcast providing unscripted conversations with leading academics and researchers on a variety of topics. If you'd like to sponsor this podcast, please reach out to info at scientificsense.com. So we're back, uh, Phil. Uh, we were talking about the kinetic inductance detectors uh, that you designed for uh, various missions. Uh, we talked about Toltec, uh, we talked about BLAST. Uh, there is another mission that you are involved in uh, called SphereX. This is NASA's uh, near-infrared spectrophotometric all-sky survey. Uh, so, so what's special about SphereX? Yeah, SphereX is, is a bit of a different kind of instrument um, from the ones that uh, we've been talking about because it's a uh, it's, it's at a different wavelength range. It's uh, near infrared. It, it doesn't use any superconducting detectors. It uses semiconducting detectors. But the, what it has in common, I guess, with some of the other uh, experiments I work on is that one of the main goals of SphereX is to um, make measurements that will really try and tell us uh, about the origin and evolution of the universe. So understand a little bit more about um, fundamental parameters in uh, in our model of cosmology. So uh, the way that it does this, and uh, and the uh, you said in the title or in the name of the experiment, it's a it's an all sky survey. So it's a, a small satellite actually. It's a very small telescope, um, and uh, uh, and it's it's amazing what you can do with small telescopes. Um, it's a twenty centimeter diameter telescope. Um, but what it has is uh, it, it's covering the entire sky. It has a very, very wide field of view. Um, and actually, another it's, it's not that unlike uh, another uh, telescope launched recently by NASA called uh, the TESS, which is um, Transiting Exoplanet uh, Sky Survey Telescope. Uh, and, and that's also a, uh, a relatively small telescope, say, compared to the Hubble. Um, but it's also got a very wide field of view, and the goal is to, to, to make observations, you know, as, over a, a large uh, number of objects in that case. And similarly, for SphereX, our goal is to um, make a, a map, as complete a map as we can make, uh, of the three-dimensional distribution of galaxies in the universe. Yeah. Um, and so the way that we do that is by uh, having this telescope, wide field of view, but then uh, we actually make uh, um, uh, an image of the sky um, in, in 96 different bands. So in 90, uh, 96 narrow wavelength bands. Um, and then from measuring the, the pattern of light in every point that we measure on the sky uh, in those 96 bands, um, where there's a, a galaxy, we can use the, the, the spectrum. So those 96 different um, wavelength measurements we can use uh, to actually locate the galaxy in, in three dimensions. We know where it is on the sky, so in two dimensions, but then we can measure its distance or its redshift um, by looking at the, the spectrum of light. And so that's one of the, the main goals uh, and one of the ones that I'm most interested in is, uh, is this three-dimensional map. And if we have a three-dimensional map of where galaxies are, 
um, then we can construct from that a, a three-dimensional map of sort of the, the matter in the universe as a whole, so the gravitational uh, mass in the universe, and uh, that includes the, the dark matter as well as the, the stars and gas. Um, and then from that, we can, we can then trace how that evolves. Uh, as a function of distance, because we have this 3D maps, which goes out, you know, pretty far uh, in in the the third dimension, in the in the distance dimension. So we can we can we can trace the evolution of uh, of matter uh, and and uh, gravitational um, uh, uh, over densities uh, as a function of distance and as a function, therefore, of time. And that helps us to understand the evolution of the universe. It's a bit it also, unusual. Yeah. To, to get sort of the all sky survey, typically you get only parts of it. Sure, that's absolutely true. And, and there, in fact, there are a number of other uh, experiments and, and groups working on doing something similar, yeah. uh, in particularly yeah. from the ground. Um, but uh, of course, from the ground, you know, you have a limited view. You can only see a certain fraction of the sky uh, from any point on the surface of the earth. So, um, so typically these surveys from the ground you know, cover uh, uh, some fraction of the sky. I mean, they're getting bigger and bigger. So, uh, you know, there's there's now optical surveys from the ground um, that cover, you know, a, at least half the sky and there's plans to cover, you know, similar amounts. There's also other satellites that will do uh, similar measurements. There's a satellite called Euclid that's a uh, uh, European um, uh, led, but uh, with collaborators in the US that will do uh, a measurement. Um, that, that's complementary to to SphereX in that uh, it's using a different form of, uh, of of emission lines to measure the the distances to the galaxies, and it's also measuring different types of galaxies and at different distances. So when you combine all of these ground based and satellite uh, um, measurements together, we really should in the next ten years uh, build up a really good um, three dimensional map of our universe, and this is going to tell us a lot. Uh, and so, uh, uh, so this is a photometric spectrum. So you, we will only see normal matter here, right? Not dark matter. Yeah, that's that's right. Um, in fact, uh, we don't really have any way yet um, of seeing directly seeing dark matter at all. Um, and so the only way that we we really know that it exists is indirectly through uh, the uh, gravitational uh, interactions that we we observe. Um, this, yeah, it's, it, being a spectrophotometric uh, survey, really what that just means is that it's, a, it's kind of like a, 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 the way that the spectrum is made is that it's in little um, sort of slices or, or images, um, photometric images, but at each, in each wavelength slice, rather than some, sort of having a, a different type of spectrometer that maybe scans in wavelength or, or, or splits up the wavelength, like with the diffraction grading. It, our our instrument doesn't do that. We just observe, uh, you know, little slices, all simultaneously, but at, at different wavelengths on the sky, and then we patch them together. It's a technology challenge too. You, you say here six by six pixel on the sky, something like fourteen billion spectra. Right. Is the expectation so? Just that there's a sheer amount of data and processing that I would imagine is a challenge. Yeah, yeah. So I think you mean six point six six point six arc seconds on a side is the is the size of the pixels, yeah. um, and and that's uh, so an arc second is you know is is um, is one three thousand six hundredth of a degree, <laughs> um, so uh, so it's um, it's about one six hundredth of a degree by one six hundredth of a degree per pixel. Um, that's actually not uh, super small in terms of uh, pixels for optical uh, instruments. I mean, the resolution of the Hubble Space Telescope, this is where we have a small telescope. The resolution of the Hubble Space Telescope is, is less than, is better than an arc second. So, uh, so we're, we're low resolution on the sky, but it's still a large number of pixels on the sky. And then each pixel has, as I said, 96 different wavelengths that we measure. So in total, it is uh, actually one of the, the issues is uh, is storing and processing all of that data. So we have a plan for that, but. Yeah, and yeah. so this is near near infrared. And so is that why uh, that, uh, that type of resolution is sufficient? Um, yeah, uh, I mean, the, the resolution, that resolution is sufficient for our science goals, which are 
since we're interested in measuring, you know, the, the large scale uh, distribution of matter in the universe, um, you know, we're, we're not, our, this, this mission is not sort of focusing in and trying to resolve, you know, very fine uh, uh, structures anywhere in, in, in the universe or in our galaxy, like, like you are with other instruments or, or missions like Hubble or James Webb. Um, so it's a survey instrument. Um, the near infrared is uh, is important because uh, it's 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 two things. So first of all, it contains the wavelength information that uh, is useful for us in that we can use to uh, to measure these uh, these distances to these galaxies. Uh, and secondly, I suppose it's uh, complementary to ground based uh, measurements because um, covering this range of wavelengths in the infrared. Uh, is not possible from the ground. There's only uh, some narrow uh, atmospheric windows that you can look at in the ground. So we can cover, you know, this wide range of wavelengths uh, that is completely inaccessible to uh, ground-based telescopes. Yeah. So, so how does it work, Phil? Um, so when you look uh, out in the sky, you're looking back in time. And so to, to get a sort of three-dimensional structure of the universe, you, you have to look... Uh, at the same distance in all directions, right? Uh, am I understanding it? Yeah, I mean, basically, the way that we construct this three-dimensional, um, you know, image or map of uh, of the structure is that, um, I mean, it, it, it turns out that that there are there are lots and lots of galaxies in the universe, but there's also a lot big gaps, you know, distances between galaxies. Yeah. So, so any uh, even any 6.6 .6 arc second pixel on the sky, um, most of them, uh, you don't have um, a galaxy uh, in that pixel. Hmm. Uh, and so um, that's, there's still um, over 100 million galaxies, uh, at least at a certain brightness level. So as you, as you look uh, you know, to fainter and fainter uh, uh, galaxies, you, you see more and more. And this is what you see in like the Hubble Deep Field, for example. Um, but uh, but we are interested in primarily the brightest galaxies, uh, the biggest galaxies, um, and so um, there's like a hundred million or or a few hundred million on the sky that we'll see, uh, and that's you know maybe one every thirty or forty uh, pixels on the sky. So um, so we're gonna construct this map by taking the uh, the 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 sources that we see. Uh, and knowing where they are, uh, both in the sky, which pixel they're in, and how far away they are, and then sort of putting that into a three-dimensional model, um, and then using that model uh, as a way of we, we, what we will see in there is uh, you know filamentary structures where you have multiple galaxies you know all arranged in in these in filaments. We'll see big bubbles and holes and voids, and we'll see all of these different structures just by putting dots, pinpoints in three-dimensional space for every single galaxy that we observe that is brighter than a certain brightness or, or, or more massive than a certain mass or, or that kind of thing. Yeah, so the confusion I have, I, I'm sure I'm missing something. So the, uh, when you see a galaxy in that pixel, uh, one out of 100 pixels, um, each of those pixels that shows a galaxy they're showing it at different times, aren't yeah. they? And That's so, right. So how would you, so maybe I'm not uh, fully understanding it. So when I say here is the structure of the universe um, and I am using, you know, kind of uh, pixels that are different time, time points, how would I construct that? Yeah, okay, I see what you're saying. So you're, and, and in fact, this is a key uh, a feature for us because yeah. Um, basically, yeah, so let me try and explain it this way. So what, what you're saying is true, that any galaxy that we look at, we're seeing it at a certain time in the past. Right. The, the, the time in the past that we're seeing it is also directly proportional to uh, its distance away from us. So, um, so we, can, we can make this three-dimensional map, but each, each spherical sort of shell around the Earth, right, uh, is like is like a, a three or is like a two dimensional you know set of galaxies um, at at a certain time in the past right uh, and so this is exactly what we're going to do is we're going to analyze the data um, looking at you know each each time slice 
So each time slice is like a, a, a surface of a sphere around the Earth, right? So we're looking at all of the galaxies that are a certain time we're getting light from a certain time ago, which is the same distance. Um, and we're going to look at those galaxies and then see how how that changes, how that the the pattern of the galaxies and the mass and everything, how it changes as you go outwards in slices or farther back in time. And that's basically tracing the evolution of uh, uh, of matter and and formation of structures uh, in the universe throughout time. So, so sort of uh, the the outcome, the output could be sort of a movie, then, right? Not sure. just so. So we can kind of see how things evolved over time. Yeah, and in fact, um, yeah, in fact, on the SphereX webpage, I believe there are movies which are. Um, you know, flying through a simulated um, set of galaxies. And as you fly through, you're flying uh, not only, you know, in space, really, but also uh, forwards or backwards in time, depending on uh, whether you're flying towards us, the Earth, or you're flying away from the Earth. Uh, and so, uh, so exactly, you could, you could make a movie and, uh, you know, there's various ways to visualize, uh, you know, this, what this map will, will be telling us. Will, uh, are there any sort of theoretical questions that uh, that we might get insight to? Uh, are there any objectives there? Yeah, um, there are. The, so, as I said, we're interested in learning about the, the evolution of structure in the universe. Uh, and also, we're interested in learning about the distribution, so how matter uh, is distributed um, throughout the universe. And one of the key kind of things that SphereX is, is really should be very good at and is highlighted is looking for any anomalies in the distribution of matter that um, might be there. Um, and by anomalies, what I mean are um, things where, you know, there are either big excesses of galaxies or, or big areas where you have, you know, really, really few galaxies, more than you would expect from kind of what's called a Gaussian, you know, random noise. Yeah. So, um, so one of the things that SphereX is really uh, going to be looking hard for is evidence for uh, something called non-Gaussianity. And as I said, that's deviations from this, uh, you know, uh, randomness. And non-Gaussianity is important because if there is non, it's predicted that there should be some non-Gaussianity uh, if you believe certain models for what happened in the very early universe. And so um, we still don't really know that much about what happened in the very early universe. So detecting uh, any kind of non-Gaussianity or deviations from, you know, this kind of just random, pure randomness uh, would actually be uh, a window into really, really early universe stuff, which is also related to possibly very high energy physics. So that's kind of the ultimate goal. <laughs> it's also very challenging. So, um, you know, we'll see how it works. Um, I, I can't quite remember, Phil, but um, there was a feature called the Great Attractor or something like that, um, that seems to be pulling in galaxies. Is that, is that, still, um, is, is that still true? Yeah, yeah, there are. I, again, I, uh, I mean, I... I I actually remember going to one of the first um, talks when I was an undergrad student uh, about this uh, at Harvard, because that's where some of the people who were really pioneering this kind of uh, survey, this is called a redshift survey, and that's exactly what uh, Spherix is doing. And some of the very early redshift surveys um, were uh, uncovering things like the Great Attractor. These, this, is a, this is nearby uh, distribution of galaxies and, uh, you know, places where there are concentrations of uh, large numbers of galaxies. Uh, obviously, the nearest concentration we're in is, a, is called the local group, but then uh, the great attractor is like some another nearby concentration. Um, there's uh, there's a, a, su a supercluster in the constellation of Virgo. I think there's Perseus that has a supercluster. I, I don't, I'm not super familiar with all of the nearby structures, but um, that that's definitely exactly what we're talking about with SphereX. It's just extending uh, from these nearby collections of galaxies um, sort of out to not not really quite to the the place, the limits of where get first galaxies formed. SphereX will, will really only go out to sort of a redshift of about one 
Um, whereas, uh, you know, some other experiments will go have, you know, will go even farther. Um, James Webb will be looking out to the very first galaxies out, as I mentioned before, out to redshift up to 10 or even, even more. Um, but, but yeah, a complete map out to redshift one that would comprise, you know, 90, more than 90% of the total volume of the observable universe. So, so it's a lot of the, the volume there. Yeah, it is still the observable universe. We are still limited, <laughs> limited by that. Uh, uh, but uh, I, I guess uh, if we can see that, we could potentially extrapolate from there to to the to the com complete universe. I mean, I think I think there's a, there's the possibility that one day we might understand enough about you know the about cosmology, especially in the very early universe, to to be able to extrapolate to um, what what the the universe that we are not yet able to see um, might be like. Uh, there are also other possibilities that if there is some uh, topology, some you know complicated uh, topology to the universe. Uh, we might actually see evidence for that in in various uh, things like the cosmic microwave background. If there are certain patterns there, we could we could we could perhaps figure out what the overall topology is. But it is also possible that um, we just won't ever really be able to know what lies outside of the universe that we can observe uh, <laughs> with with light and you know within our our light horizon. So um, it takes because it takes light a finite time. Uh, to reach us and the universe is only a finite age then then that limits our our ability to see yeah and um it, there was some speculation around sort of um uh, colliding universes that might show up in the cmb mm -hmm. um, anything like that uh, we might we might be able to get some data on well yeah i mean so that would also be something that um potentially could give uh, signals um, in this uh, matter distribution map. Yeah. Uh, and it might give some some signals, you know, there might be some sign of something like that uh, in in the SphereX data. Uh, I would say it's it's less likely. I think it's uh, um, because the the CMB is actually um, covering, you know, pretty much our entire horizon uh, size. Um, it's probably our best bet for seeing things like that. Uh, so, uh, SphereX is, is better for, for seeing effects that, that show up, um, for example, as these non-Gaussian, uh, uh, distribute, you know, non, non-Gaussian, uh, effects in the distribution of matter. Right. Right. Yeah. So I want to uh, finish up with your recent paper, uh, Phil, this is another area of interest for you, uh, design of a W band superconducting kinetic inductance qubit. Um, so there is a big race um, uh, in the area of quantum computing, universities and big companies. Um, so this is a different type of qubit, uh, kinetic inductance qubit, right? Yes. Yeah. And, and if you remember, we started talking about kinetic inductance detectors. So it's basically yeah. it's using the same uh, physics that we're using in the detectors for astronomy. So, yeah. And so, how is this? Uh, how is this more beneficial? Yeah. So, so it's um, as I said, the the idea is kind of comes out of uh, of the types of uh, things that we use for uh, astronomy detectors, but um, but it's it's replacing. So so it's a superconductor, right? It's still superconducting, yeah. um, and uh, and there are um, currently one of the you know best. Uh, types of uh, quantum computing systems that you know people are working on uh, is uh, is superconducting quantum computing systems. Um, IBM, Google, uh, Rigetti is another company working on them. Um, Amazon is working on their own superconducting quantum computer. All of these superconducting quantum computers, for their qubits, which is you know their their fundamental unit of logic. Um, all of them are using uh, an effect that is uh, based on uh, the Josephson effect. So Josephson junctions, which are um, tunnel junctions between superconductors that were first described and won the Nobel Prize for uh, Brian Josephson, a physicist. Um, and, uh, and so these um, Josephson junctions are used because what, one of the things that you need uh, in, to make a, a qubit 
Um, just like uh, a transistor or a regular logic bit is you need, uh, you need to have nonlinear uh, behavior. So you need to have some nonlinearity and, and that's what allows you to go to sort of a zero or one state. And, and in the case of a quantum, a qubit, then uh, this nonlinearity is also uh, able to be used and, and put into efficient state as well of, of your zero and one state. Um, but but these uh, junctions are um, ha have have some issues. They're they're sometimes tricky to make, tricky to um, to to make reliably. And and one of the key things today is uh, is trying to make more and more qubits, so bigger and bigger uh, arrays of of these qubits that are are connected together. Just like uh, you know, it was important to make more and more transistors in, in regular computers. Um, and so, so and so Google, our, uh, uh, I remember, uh, so Google's uh, recent demonstration was something like 53 qubits or something like that, right? Yeah, yeah. They have on order 50 and, and IBM has about the same number, and, yeah. um, which, you know, isn't that many. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right. Of course, the computing power goes up exponentially with the number. So, you know, you don't have to get that many before you're able to compete or do better than a regular computer. But, um, but so the there's two things about our um, design um, that are that are different. So the first thing is that we're not using any junctions. <laughs> um, instead, what we're using is a, a superconducting nanowires. So very thin, um, just thin wires uh, of superconductor, and these have are nonlinear uh, because uh, because of not not an effect called nonlinear kinetic inductance, which uh, which we. <laughs> Uh, which we've been using or, or noticed uh, when we were making our astronomy detectors, um, and because there's no um, there's no junction, um, the the thought is that they would be less sensitive to uh, a certain type of noise that you have in this uh, in the gap in between the superconductors in this tunnel junction, and also uh, the hope would be that they would be um, easier again, just like the kinetic inductance detectors, easier to fabricate uh, and easier to make large numbers of. The other thing that's different is um, it's W band. So W band is a waveguide band that is uh, at centered at around 90 gigahertz or uh, 100 gigahertz. Um, the qubits that IBM or 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 Google are using, um, they tend to operate, you know, in less than 10 gigahertz. Um, and so the, that's a, that's an important difference because um, at uh, at 10 gigahertz, one of the things that you have to do if you want your quantum computer to work is you have to make sure that it's not um, upset by thermal noise. So um, you need to cool everything really cold and you have to cool it for 10 gigahertz. So the, the temperature you have to cool it to is proportional to the frequency that your qubit operates. Hmm. So at 10 gigahertz, they're cooling their, these qubits down to sort of 15 degree, 15 milladegrees above absolute zero, 15 <laughs> millikelvin. Hmm. Um, but if we can make ours work at 90 gigahertz or 100 gigahertz, um, then we only would have to cool them to maybe 200 millikelvin, which still sounds pretty cold. Yeah. But but it turns out that it's a lot easier to cool stuff down. And in fact, we this is the temperature that we tend to operate our our superconducting detector arrays, the ones that we use on the balloon. We operate those at around 200 to 300 millikelvin, um, and that and that's a lot cheaper. And it requires and it's, you can have one of these in your home. Uh, you can actually now plug into the wall and get down to 250 millikelvin in your home. But if 15 millikelvin is is probably a little bit too much power and too big for somebody yeah. to have in in their in their home. So so there's two ways that it could be better. Um, and it's early days for this technology. We just we just submitted this paper. Uh, it was published in Applied Superconductivity. But um, but who knows? Maybe this is the right way to go. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's exciting. I, I don't know much about this. So are these qubits uh, in operation, are they, are they sort of in an entangled state? Uh, the issue is that we can't really keep them in a, in a stable state, right? Is that, is yeah. that the challenge? Right, yeah. So what you want to do to do your calculations, you want to you wanna keep your, um, your, your qubits uh, as, for as long as possible um, in a uh, uh, in a state that is uh, is is not um, say collapsed or or inter interfered with by the environment, uh, mm -hmm. and usually the environment means um, you know any kind of uh, uh, thermal disturbance. So 
um, you can you can uh, you can think of a quantum system as uh, as as sort of being this like a uh, pure kind of uh, um, system that could be entangled, and you could have you know uh, multiple states existing simultaneously. Um, I guess like in Schrodinger's cat, you know, your cat being alive and dead at the same time, although that's, I think, a bit of a stretch. Um, but that at some point, the, the rest of the environment, the rest of the universe surrounding it uh, destroys that um, coherence is called. So uh, what you want is you don't want to have decoherence. Uh, and, and so the higher the frequency that your qubit operates, the less sensitive it is to, uh, to, to decoherence from the environment, which is why um, atomic qubits, so there are certain types of qubits that work with, uh, with optical light, um, yeah. and, uh, and these can work at room temperature because, um, because the, the, the thermal radiation you know, from the room is, is, is much lower energy, say, than the, mm. the energy of the, the qubit. Um, but superconducting qubits obviously have to work uh, cold enough that your material is superconducting, um, but uh, but they don't have to work at the frequencies and the energies that uh, that they're using um, you know right now, uh, and so uh, this is a a design and a proposal to uh, to make qubits uh, that work at at these higher frequencies. Yeah, yeah, it's exciting. So in conclusion, Phil, it, it's it seems like you have a foundational technology, uh, superconducting kinetic inductance. Um, and, and you're using it in instrumentation, uh, possible uses in quantum computing. Uh, so if you look forward five, 10 years, uh, do you see other applications uh, for this platform technology? Yeah, um, I do. Uh, I mean, for example, uh, there is um, my, my, my old group where I, I worked uh, before I moved to Arizona State uh, in Cardiff. Um, has uh, a, uh, a spin out that they are um, working on to use this technology for um, millimeter wave security scanners. And this would be mm. passive uh, imaging. Um, so instead of, uh, so in airports or for scanning, uh, you can see through canvas trucks and things like that. It's, it's, uh, it seems like it's very uh, potentially very useful right now in, in the UK um, because of uh, the, the new Brexit rules. I um, mean, they, they have to do a lot of this. Um, in addition, uh, you know, there's there's other applications. So Earth observing, for example, um, the uh, millimeter wave uh, satellites that that look at uh, the at the Earth's atmosphere uh, are one of the the two in addition with near infrared actually are one of the two main uh, ways that we 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 can measure um, uh, what's happening in terms of uh, the weather. So we get uh, information about uh, water vapor in, in the atmosphere, which is very useful for predicting uh, things like rain, which we haven't had here in Arizona very much for the last year. Um, so, so there are a number of, uh, of, of applications that are not in astronomy or in, uh, in quantum computing or fundamental physics uh, as well. And then there are other things too. I guess um, the other things that we talk about in my group are um, using uh, superconducting devices or a very uh, common now technology for for things like searching for new fundamental particles like axions, um, and yeah. uh, we're also talking about if we can possibly use superconducting devices uh, to determine whether or not gravity is quantized by detecting gravitons. So there are a number of new uh, and exciting areas that we're we're thinking of, and I suppose it's nice having sort of this this base in this technology as a springboard uh, for these ideas. And our philosophy is usually that we, we try and think of things that would be really cool, but people think now might be not possible or very difficult. I think quantum computing was a, a something like that, say, 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Um, and then people were working on it. And now, you know, it's becoming a reality. So I think there are other there are other things that are going to be like that. And I, I would think, um, yeah, from a material sciences perspective, as we get uh, higher temperature superconducting materials, that is going to propel this even further, right? Yeah, no, definitely. There's a lot of uh, applications out there for, for higher TC materials. That's a, it's a very exciting time for that as well. Um, and I know that, uh, you know, there's records being broken. So, 
we we also we follow those uh, those those developments uh, very keenly. Um, and uh, I mean, I guess one of the the materials that you know we've talked about using uh, is uh, not that high TC, but it's um, it's one of the highest TC sort of standard superconductors or metallic ones called uh, magnesium diboride. So that's that's something that uh, you know uh, is is possibly going to be uh, next. And I guess the other thing though is. Um, it's also that there's been developments of cryogenic technology. So, um, so the fact is, it's a lot easier now to go and buy uh, a an instrument for not a lot of money uh, that you can plug into the wall and will cool down, you know, something to um, a temperature, you know, below uh, four degrees a, uh, Kelvin, four degrees above absolute zero. So, um, so yes, a high TC is is definitely something exciting. Uh, but uh, also, I think there is uh, this great potential for uh, even using uh, lower uh, critical temperature superconductors because of the cryo. Yeah, I can see this now, Phil. Uh, they're going to say, if you're not using your iPhone, put that in the freezer. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, it's running a quantum computer in there. It's just a matter of time, I think. I'm not sure that the cryo will get that small. <laughs> Um, but that would that would certainly be yeah be something worth worth paying attention to, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, uh, this has been great, Phil. Thanks so much for spending time with me. Sure, no problem, Gil. Thank you. Thank you. This is a Scientific Sense podcast, providing unscripted conversations with leading academics and researchers on a variety of topics. If you'd like to sponsor this podcast, please reach out to info at scientificsense.com.